Good morning, I'm Ralph Albert Thomas. I'm the CEO for the New Jersey Society of CPAs, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you this, more, uh, this morning to our New Jersey Business and Economic Roundtable. I think we put together an exciting panel of experts to share their insights on important issues facing New Jersey. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of all that's taking place in Trenton. If you haven't, I understand. What, I, let me know what rock you've been under. Um, it's been interesting, and as I shared uh, in our uh, round, uh, Issues Watch segment uh, that we had previous earlier in the program, it's going to be an interesting two weeks, I think, in, in Trenton. But we have a distinguished panel of uh, presenters here, and, and I think they will be able to provide us some really, really great insights of, of what's going on down in Trenton these days. Um, but before we get started with the program, well, first of all, let me bring up our sponsor, Gordon, from uh, Columbia Bank. Uh, as I've always said throughout the program, we couldn't do these events without sponsors, and Gordon has been a great sponsor uh, for the society through, I guess we we're talking about 15 years or more. So Gordon, thank you. Why don't you make some uh, opening remarks? Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you. Good morning. It's, it's great to see everyone here uh, after last night's gala. Uh, this has been uh, quite a whirlwind week. It's great to see uh, many of our old friends and certainly uh, great to make some new friends. So uh, it's not over yet, though. Okay. So first, on behalf of Columbia Bank, I would like to thank all the outgoing <coughs> president, the outgoing president, Sarah Crom, uh, for a great year, um, and all the society individual chapter officers, again, for a great year and furthering the mission of the, of the NJCPA. Next, I'd like to congratulate the newly minted NJCPA president, Kyle Sell. Uh, Kyle, there go your billing hours. It's gone for a month, one year at least. So, but all kidding aside, um, it's a very exciting time for Kyle to be presiding over the society, and we wish you the best in your term. I also want to congratulate all the new presidents and other chapter members of each individual chapter. Your value to the efforts of the NJCPA is critical. The theme of this year's conference is very near and dear to my Columbia Bank banks and I'm sure all of your hearts as we strive to go beyond and exceed expectations and maximize value to our clients and prospects. We accomplish this by listening and providing well thought out technological financial solutions to issues and other items that our clients may have. Columbia Bank, a David amongst Goliaths, commits to providing added value solutions to wow your clients and support your efforts to assist in growing their respective businesses. We are proud to once again sponsor this New Jersey business and economic discussion this morning. Thank you. And Gordon, thank you and Columbia Bank for all your support over the years. We surely, we truly appreciate it. It's our it. pleasure, Ralph. Thank, thank you. you. As I said, we have a very distinguished uh, uh, panel today and looking forward to some very lively uh, conversation. If you have questions, please use the um, convention app to submit those questions. We also have uh, online uh, approximately around 250 individuals who have signed up to be a part of today's Issues Watch. So again, to ask a question during the roundtable, use the convention mobile app and simply go into this session to submit your question. And uh, I'll begin by introducing our distinguished panel. <clears throat> to my immediate left, we have Assemblyman Roy Fryman who represents New Jersey's 16th District and serves on the Commerce and Economic Development, Financial Institutions and Insurance and Transportation and Independent Authorities Committees. Did I get it right? Yes, you did. <laughs> and proud to say that he is, uh, I'm in the 16th District uh, there and you know, I really appreciate the Assemblyman being here. Thank you. Next to the Assemblyman, we have uh, our Vice President of Government Relations, Jeff Brickhazerman. Uh, Jeff's been with the Society now close to 30 years, Jeff? Yeah, believe it or not. Okay, <laughs> we believe it. <laughs> but uh, Jeff's pinch hitting for um, 
Dr. Bridget Harrison, who uh, uh, could not make it uh, to be here with us today. Uh, ne our next panelist is Rhonda Schaefer. Uh, Rhonda and I have gotten to know each other over the years because uh, she is a, a new business correspondent with um, new, new NJ TV 12. Did I get it right? No, Almost. No, just NJ TV. NJ TV. And uh, does a great job bringing to the forefront issues that are impacting New Jersey and um, the uh, business community as well as uh, constituents in New Jersey. And to the far end, someone who is not a stranger to the, at the NJCPA is Thank Senator you. Steve Orho. Um, Thank you. He has been on our panels before yes. and has uh, our, the lone CPA Correct. in the legislature. Correct. So, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome <laughs> to, our, to our panel today. Thank you. And again, if you want to submit questions, please go to the app and uh, we will get, get going with our panel. So as I stated, it's interesting times in Trenton these days. Uh, this morning I was reading all the commentary and Politico, so I, I would like to start by with the first question going to Senator Orho. Uh, and it's the same question I started uh, our panel last year with. <laughs> and will there be a fairy tale ending to the budget debate, or will there be a government shutdown? Give us the inside information. A fairy tale ending. Well, with a fairy tale, I don't think there's going to be a shutdown. I, I do think that um, there will be a budget that's presented to the governor that the, obviously the legislature would have voted on. Um, I, the, but the governor can then do a number of things. He can't add anything into the budget, but you can subtract. You can subtract from numbers. You can line item uh, things out. You can delete wording. So there's a number of significant things he can do, but then the legislature has to take action. Um, and you just saw with the dark money bill recently, there was the prospect of an override. There hadn't been an override in 22 years but essentially the same exact bill that the legislature had agreed to was returned back to the governor. And I don't think he signed it yet, but I think he had agreed to sign it. So I, I don't think that there's gonna be, I personally don't think there's gonna be a government shutdown. Could end up being an override. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it's gonna be a fairy tale ending either. In a fairy tale, everybody goes off in the sunset and they live happily ever after. <laughs> Um, I don't think that's going to happen, and I think it will continue to be um, some, you know, uh, a little bit of, um, uh, you know, through the whole process. I think, you know, there'll be feelings that are, that are you know, people, some people will be annoyed, and uh, relationships will be frayed. Uh, but let's face it, we've got to get something done. So okay. I don't think there'll be a shutdown. Simmerman, let me move to you and get your view on... Well, you're in your first term, completing yes. your first term in the, in the legislature. And um, what, are you, what are your sentiments? What are your feelings? Do you think there will be a shutdown? I don't think so. Um, I agree with the senator. I think that um, eventually there will be a compromise worked out. And unfortunately, it will not be an opportunity to, to bring the parties together that are currently have friction. So they're not going to use this as an opportunity to say, well, you know, let's finally figure this out. It's, it's just going to keep that divide, that personal friction going. Um, but I think, I hope everyone's smart enough to realize that nobody wins in a shutdown. All right. Okay. So Ron, I'm going to kick it to you and, and get your view on it from, you know, the, the correspondence perspective of what you think will, will be happening. So I can tell you we are preparing to staff for a possible <laughs> shutdown uh, because we know that anything can happen. I would expect the, the night uh, before the deadline will be a late night. Mm -hmm. um, I'm encouraged by what I hear here that there won't be a shutdown. I think there will be a lot of dueling press conferences. Um, but to the point that nobody's going to win from it, they won't. And uh, I don't think we need to go through a lot of drama 
Work does need to get done. There's a lot of huge issues facing New Jersey. So things need to be put to bed and move forward on, on a lot of legislation that's pending. Um, so I, I hope there's not, but I will tell you, regardless of what we hear, up to the last minute, we will prepare for a potential shutdown. Everyone will prepare to work late. Um, and then hopefully there'll be a surprise at the end. And I agree, there will be no fairy tale story <laughs> that we're telling. I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, teeth gnashing and drama that goes along. So Jeff, let me, let, me, let me punt to you and what you're hearing with your colleagues in the other associations like the Chamber, NJBIA, Commerce and Industry. What, is, what's, what are their sentiments on this topic? I think, generally speaking, people believe the odds are that there will not be a shutdown. Um, but, you know, it's hard. It's certainly nobody feels that, like, oh, there's no way there's going to be a shutdown because the last few weeks of the uh, budget session, anything can happen. So if it did happen, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't plan a vacation right now for a state park, though I think it probably will not shut down. To me, what's really up in the air is what any kind of final budget will look like, what kind of deal will be worked out. Uh, and the really interesting thing to see is if they can't work out a deal, what will happen if the governor vetoes the budget completely or does a line item veto? To me, the, the fascinating question will be, will the le legislature over, override his veto? Because I don't think that's happened, not in my recent memory. Did you say that? 22, year, 22, 22 years. 22 years yeah. ago? So that, to me, is what, I mean, I hope they work everything out and we get a budget and there's a compromise uh, with as few, if no taxes, uh, you know, with as little, t with as minimum tax hike if there's any. Um, but if that doesn't happen, the excitement, the World Series will be on the override, if there is an override. Mm -hmm. For me, at least. Okay. So one of the big issues that is getting a lot of air in, in the press is the millionaire's tax. And what we've been hearing is that the two leaders, the Senate President, the Assembly Speaker are not supportive of that. Let me go to you, Assemblyman, and get your perspective on how do you see this playing out? Because obviously it's an important component of the budget that, that the governor presented. Uh, he wants to be able to have a surplus and whatnot. Give me your, your perspective on what's going to happen, given that the two, le two leaders of the houses there, and I believe their, their, their uh, caucuses support this, that there shouldn't be a reduction in the millionaire's tax. It's going to be, I find it difficult to predict this, because we're not working exclusively with logic and economics coming into play. You have personalities, you have, it goes beyond just looking at the issues. Um, that, and that is influencing a lot of the discussion. Um, the millionaire's tax, and you and I had a chance to talk about this, I've had a number of people come into my office in support of the millionaire's tax, telling us why we need to do it. And I often would ask them, well, why? Wait, what is your rationale as to why you think we need it? They said, well, we need the programs that are being put out there. And I said, well, what if we could hypothetically fund these without this tax? And the answer universally comes back, no, we want the tax. Which really gets into, it's not necessarily about the revenue, it's about economic justice, social justice, um, that is really driving this. It is a sentiment of, you know, there's been a, a divide growing between um, the high earners and middle class, and that gap keeps getting wider, and this is a way of paring that back a bit. Um, so when you have those forces versus economic forces coming into play and math coming into play, now you're going into completely different realm. And so we've heard the, the legislature say, no, we don't want this. The governor said yes whether they end up with a different tax as we ended up last year. We went into the process 
without a corporate business tax. We ended up with a corporate business tax and a millionaire's tax um, at, a, at the $5 million level. It'd be interesting to see how this plays out, but I'm, I'm at a loss because it's not the math that's driving this. Senator Orho, what are you? What are you? What are your sentiments in, in your in, in the Senate? I don't. I don't think there's um, very much support for a millionaire's tax, and I think what we've been seeing for many years. Um, and one thing we've got to be very, you know, that I think makes the debate even possible is is the revenues came in better than had been expected. Uh, the direct payments, you know, it came in. April 15th is the fourth largest revenue stream. One day is the fourth largest revenue stream in, in, you know, in, our, in our budget. Obviously, the largest one is the income tax, then you get sales tax, and then you have the corporate business tax. Um, but the direct payments came in, you know, uh, significantly, well, I think they were like one point, almost $1.3 billion in direct payments. I, I firmly believe that's part of the idea of getting rid of the estate tax and actually keeping some more capital that have been here. But for years, New Jersey, you could look at the IRS data, $30 billion in like a 12 year period had you know, left the state. You know, that's the net migration out uh, when you count those coming in, those leaving. But that's $30 billion, so I think, and you heard the Senate President actually speak about that um, uh, you know, very, very recently. And that's the thing that has to turn around. And people have to recognize whether it's the social justice or whether it really does come down more to the economics. 1% of our taxpayers pay 40% of the tax. So you, if you cut off that revenue stream, forget about the programs. And that's part of the, the path to progress that we had talked about. And just if I can take a real quick divergent, I gotta thank you know, Ralph Thomas and the New Jersey CPA Society because Ralph was a key, key member of the committee for the path to progress. And that's some of the structural change that we have to have. Um, and having the New Jersey, uh, have, having Ralph, the New Jersey CPA Society as, as a member gave, I think, that, uh, that you know, committee that had put together by Senator Sweeney, which I was uh, proud to co-chair with Senator uh, Paul Solo and Assemblyman Lou Greenwald. Uh, but that's the stuff that we have to be focused on right, you know, right now. So the issue of the millionaire tax, it might be very popular. It's, it's a very bad idea from an economic standpoint. So you guys agree that it's a bad idea. The governor wants it. Is this a, something that could force us to go to a shutdown? And I'm going to go right back to I think the, what played out over that dark money bill was extremely interesting uh, because the legislature overwhelmingly approved it. The governor conditionally vetoed it. Um, now, obviously, the legislature could have agreed to it. Um, but I, obviously, the only thing that changed in the bill, in the, on the Senate side, went from uh, bill number 1,500 to bill number 150. We, we dropped to zero. That was the only thing that changed. Um, and so, so therefore, I, I think there was, you know, so was that, it wasn't technically a ro override, but it was as close as you can come to one. Um, I, I, I think any governor is going to be concerned about an override. I think any governor is going to be very concerned about, you know, an override of a budget. So um, I don't, I really don't believe there's going to be the millionaire's tax, and I really don't believe there's going to be a shutdown. Okay. Rhonda, let me, let me ask you, you, you interact with businesses and, and, and business, the business community. What are you hearing from your discussions with leaders in business? Certainly business leaders don't want a millionaire's tax. I mean, it's a hard sell. I think that income inequality issue is a big one. It's not just in New Jersey, but that is in some ways politicizing the numbers of it, the math. Business people don't want to pay more taxes. I hear that constantly. They're being taxed too much. Um, actually, the senator and I were at a panel a couple <laughs> weeks ago with some business people, and uh, not only are they feeling they're taxed too much, they think regulations are too high, and there's a generally very high burden. And for small business owners, this millionaire's tax would have an impact. So um, listen, nobody willingly says, I want to pay more taxes. 
Um, businesses are arguing that, that they're at the point where it's difficult for them to take a, an additional tax burden. I have not had one business person say, um, please, raise my taxes. But there are people who do believe there are issues, whether it's structural reforms or economic inequality, there's a recognition that their customers are having issues, right? So you can only have a successful business if people can afford to buy your product. So there is a sense that something needs to be fixed, but nobody's embracing the millionaire's tax. Or I should say very few people are embracing the millionaire's tax. It is a hard sell. It's a hard sell when the budget also includes money for a rainy day fund. Because then you have money you know, that you can, in theory, pull from. So I think that's where it is. And certainly the business groups in the state have been vocal against a millionaire's tax. OK. Simmerman, I want to go to you about we, Moody's recently came out and ranked New Jersey at the bottom of the 50 states when it comes to being ready for the next recession. Yeah. They also cited that poor budget reserves and pension risks. Uh, Governor Murphy wants more revenue raisers, while Senate President Sweeney wants to cut expenses. So the question is, does New Jersey have a revenue problem or a spending problem? Yes, uh, is the answer. <laughs> to, to, to both? <laughs> yes. Um, so if, unless you control spending, you have a revenue problem. Right. Um, and we have not, so I, I parachuted into this role um, and last year or a year and a half ago, and I looked at the budgeting process, and I'm still trying to scratch my head and figure this out. How is it that constitutionally we only do an annual budget? What organization at $38 billion only does a one-year budget. It's absurd. Um, and we need to have a, a longer-term view on how we're spending money. We also need to stop, if we're ever going to get out of this cycle, aside from structural changes, there has to be a structural change associated with the budgetary process. Um, so bringing into zero-based budgeting, for example, into the discussion would go a long way of figuring out where do we have duplication? Where do we, where should we, instead of not increasing funding, where shouldn't we fund at all? Because we have overlapping and we need to merge um, various different areas because they're doing very, very similar things. So I do think you have some structural and cultural approaches as to how you spend money. And unless that gets under control, then of course you have, the, you're dealing now of saying, let's just raise more revenue. Um, you have no other, you gotta, or, and government also doesn't do what business does, um, which is prioritization. It seems like in, in, in business, we, we always say, all right, it's a great project, great idea, but we need to prioritize what we can do. I don't think government has ever realized that you can do anything, you just can't do everything at once. Okay. You mentioned the fact that we're, we do a budget annually. I know um, at a recent, um, uh, business and industry uh, event down in uh, East Windsor, I, I brought up with the, uh, the treasurer. Why is it that we don't go to a multi-year budget? Did you get an answer? Not really. <laughs> so I'm just curious as, as to what your colleagues in the legislature think about that when we've got other states that have multi-year budgets. And there's always this 11th hour rush to get the budget done. So. You know, Ralph, it's interesting, because the one thing that government has not done, government, and we've said it many times, 25 years behind business. Um, the interesting thing is, until a, a few years ago, we didn't have a full debt report. And now we, we actually, on a bipartisan basis, I know Senator Charlotte and the Senate with the sponsors, count everything, count the pensions, count the post-employment you know, uh, medical, uh, because what gets measured gets, gets mastered. And, and Rhonda brought up a very good point, this issue of a, a rainy day fund. I mean, because we look at it, it's on a cash basis, essentially, essentially a cash basis. The, when, in the years when they just delayed the pension payments, it was like, oh, we have a surplus. We don't have a surplus. When you add in the debt that we have, and we're not even any near, we're any near close 
to have an, the ability to have a rainy day fund or you know, a, a fund balance when you're talking about $151 billion and more of either pension or post-employment benefit you know, type of stuff. So the idea of having, like we used to do all the time in, in business, you, know, you had your annual budget, you had your five-year projection. And what were those, and really focusing on the risk. And the biggest risk we have right now and you talk about, we got to get our spending under control because will there be another recession? We all know there'll be another recession. Right. How long, how deep, we don't know. But I was there in the great, you know, in the great recession, and the uh, revenues went down by $3 billion like this. If that happens today, then, you know, the kind of shape that we would, that we would be in. So we have to deal with the structural cost changes. I don't think we have a choice. There's no choice. And, there were, and that choice should have been made many, many, many years ago. So Jeff, we, uh, we have a question that's come in um, from the audience and it's asking, it's a, the question is that the society, the NJCPA has publicly backed the Path to Progress package of bills. Uh, for those that may not be aware, back in late May, Mm -hmm. uh, the Senate President had a press conference where he introduced 27 bills that emanated from the Path to Progress report. So Jeff, the, the, the question is, uh, given the tension that seems to exist between the Governor and the Senate President, what's the likelihood that these bills will see the light of day? Well, there's, there's 27 bills. I think a lot of them, or certainly some of them, are not at all really partisan or there's no real divide between the Senate president and the governor, and I think some of those will pass. The most important reforms or bills, the ones that I think underlie the whole spending problem that we have in New Jersey, which is pension and health benefit reforms, which make up 25% of the state budget, which without change will only get worse and worse, and there's $150, $150 billion uh, unfunded liability for those, those two areas, pensions, health benefits. I don't see the Senate President and the Governor coming to any type of agreement on that for a long time, if ever. The only thing I think could eventually force the Governor governor to, you know, back some type of reforms, maybe not this year, but two or three years from now, is as, uh, you know, the cost of those two programs is going to, the percentage of the budget, budget is going to rise and rise to pay for that. And at some point, uh, I don't think the Senate president is going to give the governor the taxes that he wants to pay for that. And at some point, the governor's either going to have to cut, you know, social programs, uh, programs targeted at uh, lower income individuals, groups that are more progressive, programs that are supported by progressives. And I think he's going to be torn between two constituencies, which is the state workers and the groups and, and segments of the population that he's really trying to help. Other than that, right now, I don't think there's going to be any agreement for a long time on, uh, between the governor and the Senate president on the fundamental problems, which are the pension, in my mind, pension and, and health care costs. And, and I'll just add, uh, personally, the idea that the state is wasting lots of money and spending lots of money on you know, unnecessary programs or fraud and corruption. I don't think you know insiders really think that's that's generally true. There is some wasteful spending. There's you know some mismanagement, but the real problem, from my perspective, is the pension and health care costs eats up a huge portion of the budget, and that to me is the huge spending problem. Jeff, you bring up a good point that the, the big elephant in the room in New Jersey is the pension obligation. And I think from our um, Path to Progress meetings, uh, the estimate was that if we don't do anything by 2022, 2023, mm -hmm. 
the cost uh, of the of the pension to the to budget will be around 30 percent of the budget. Yeah. We'll go to that. So there hasn't been a lot of conversation emanating from the governor on the pension, other than we have a promise. Where do we go with this? Yeah, Ralph, a very good point. And, and, and the issue is, you look at all the studies that were done. You first had the, uh, the current governor who was the, had the Murphy Commission. And at the time, the, the problem was $11 billion. If it was $11 billion today, we'd sit there and say, okay, this is something that is manageable. Then you had the you know, Tom Byrne and Tom Healy committee, the commission, the report, and it had grown to over $40 billion. Now just the pension is $115 billion. Not dealing with the problem, it, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. So what we came up with was the idea of the hybrid, to the, a cash balance plan, kind of like, like most of people in this room have probably already uh, implemented and, and whatnot. And the reason why we had to do that is the first $40,000, you still need contributions going into the defined benefit plan so that you can pay the benefits and whatnot. And then the issue, if you take a look, you ask most younger workers, what do you want? They want portability. A lot of them aren't going to stay for 10 years in, in the same job. They're going to you know, move to a, a different job. So you know, every five years, if they're moving to a different, they then take that money and they, they take it with them you know, as, as they go. But one of the key things that we, I mean, we have to do something on the healthcare side. Obviously, we have got to do something on the pension side. But on the healthcare side, there's that Cadillac tax that's going to come in in, in, in 2022, I believe. That's 40%. So I, I just want to react a little bit to, to what Jeff said of that uh, members of NJEA, you know, the, uh, are talking about how their cash flow, their take home pay, is reduced over the last nine years. Um, and I personally, I think that is a legitimate, honest reflection of what has happened to the members of NJEA. Their net take-home payment after benefits is lower than it was nine years ago. Now, I'm not sure if that same thing holds true um, in the private sector overall. It does. Uh, but, and just when, but one of the things that I think is preventing movement is a lack of trust between the union and the Senate president. So there is, you knew there was a battle in the last cycle um, where there was a, the NJEA endorsed um, a candidate um, to unseat Steve Sweeney, and it resulted in not only horrible friction between the two, but Steve Sweeney was elected by the greatest margin he's ever had. Uh, as a result of all this. So it really backfired. So when I ask NJEA, we, you know, this is not sustainable. You know, we need to make changes. Um, they just, free, and, and why not try to end up with CWA had, where they sat down with the governor, they negotiated, and it ended up with a win-win all around. And NJEA is just saying, we just don't trust the people at the table. The only one we trust at the table is the governor, and we don't trust um, Steve Sweeney. And until they can, we can actually get them at the table, I think it would be, you need to have the negotiated outcome. I think if it's forced upon it, if legislatively we merely force upon structural changes without bringing them in, I, I think we're just creating more friction out there and more separation. Uh, and I'd like to see what was done with CWA. Okay, Rhonda, you were... I just going to weigh in. off that point. I mean, this is one of the issue that we're coming out still of the Great Recession. If you look at national numbers, it's just recently that people's income gains have started to pick up. So it wasn't just New Jersey. Income wage gains lagged. So that meant we all felt like we were falling behind because if you look at inflation numbers and other cost of living expenses, we were. And we certainly know in New Jersey we have a high cost of living, and I'm sure you've heard that from your clients, you know, when they come in and their tax bills are up and they're not really getting ahead. So part of the background is this economic picture that we really can't completely control in New Jersey. So yes, their health expenses uh, they can't keep up with because, to your point, we're all probably experiencing that as well. 
The idea that you t say to the new workers coming in, this pension plan you will have, and by the way, you're lucky to have, because a lot of private industry, you're lucky to have a 401k, you're lucky if they match it. And I know people go into state government for different reasons, and thank goodness they do. I don't think it's going to stop people from working for the government. There are many wonderful other benefits, whether it's time off. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of pluses. So I, I think they're still going to have people that will come. I think it's a political minefield to start with the legacy uh, pension. I mean, the health care is one thing, but it's... I understand the numbers, that something has to be done. I wish you gentlemen luck, because it's going to be very hard. But you can at least start with these incremental, start for the new people coming in. Start, it, yes, it should be negotiated. Get some sense of unity, and everyone's got to kind of move the needle together. Not only do we have this huge pension and health care burden, we also have a large percent of our budget just on debt service. So when you look at how much is just taken out of the budget and what we're left with, you know, we really are just paying money and we're not really seeing anything from it as a citizen of New Jersey. It's not, we're not getting better services because we're paying debt from years ago. So uh, there has to be some start somewhere, but you can understand where everyone's coming from just from the economic environment that, that we've been in until recently. And even... Even in New Jersey, our economic numbers, our unemployment rate, while low, is still higher than the national average. So, you know, it's been a long time to kind of get back to a better place for the economy, and all of that affects how people think. Rhonda, let me stay with you on that point. You know, we, we talked about what you're hearing from the business community. What are you hearing from the average New Jerseyan about their plight here in New Jersey. So before I get to that, a quick point about uh, business people in New Jersey. We just at NJTV started this little digital series where we're going out talking to business owners around the state, small, big companies. It is so inspiring because, A, people want to have businesses here. People like New Jersey. They like living in New Jersey. They see a lot of benefits. People have family ties here. And it's been very inspirational just listening to these business owners who really want to do business here and are excited, except the cost side. So you have this enthusiasm. Then you have the day-to-day -day burdens that they feel are going up. So it's the same with residents. People don't want to leave New Jersey except for the financial. This is a great state, mm -hmm. and people say that all the time. I mean, we have so much to do, amazing people, it's diverse. People don't say, I'm gonna move to Pennsylvania because their parks are better, or I like the neighborhoods more. They say that the taxes are lower. So um, I think people would prefer to stay here. I mean, I really don't hear many people saying, oh, I hate New Jersey, X, Y, Z. I mean, look, NJ Transit, traffic, whatever. You know, we know there are some issues. But it's really only the financial issues that are really weighing on people. And so that's unfortunate, and I hope that will be reversed. Because I think, you know, people really do love living in Jersey, except, and the except is very big, whether it's taxes or other expenses. An interesting question has popped up. Are our members who pretty much touch every constituency business here in New Jersey. And the question is, a client asked me whether I would recommend moving to another state. What do I say to them, given the current situation? And I know that's something that we've talked about in the past, in, the, oh, yeah. in our working group uh, session about, you know, how do, you, how do our members answer that question that comes from their client or their business about we move? And, it's just not those folks that are approaching retirement. We're talking about folks that are still in the workforce and, and things like that. So, um, want to take a similar? Uh, you want to go first? You go first. first. I, New we Jersey, we, we know New Jersey is not the low cost state. Right. We know that even with structural changes, it will never become the low cost state. What people are wrestling with 
is the value proposition. Um, we buy products all the time that are high-end products. Many of us sit and probably have an iPhone, and it's not the cheapest phone you can get out there because we felt that there was value associated with it. One of the things that seems to be resonating with the people I'm speaking with is how difficult it is to live and work in New Jersey. So it's this ease or lack of ease that really permeates. Financial is a significant part of it. It's really hard to make ends meet, but it's hard to get around. If you own a business, it's regulations. It's that a simple thing that I want to do, I want to put a sign up, I want to do something, I want to expand, it becomes a nightmare. I think that there is a lot, aside from doing structural changes, which is long term, there are, we have to work on a number and quite a few of the smaller things that would ease life, would make it just simpler on, on how to do the day to day. Um, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with the regulatory. Getting a building permit, even to redo your deck or your kitchen, is cumbersome. It's difficult. It doesn't have to be. There are models out there that say that we could, there are best practices out there that we can adopt that says, look, we can still have the safety of inspections, but not the nightmare associated with getting them. So I, I think that I, I, Rhonda is absolutely right. This is a wonderful state. It's disheartening that people are leaving only because of the financials. Um, and we've got to change that. We have to change the value proposition. Now, you recently hosted a group of um, folks out at Raritan Community Valley, uh, Raritan Valley Community College. And the discussion was a, a, a whiteboard kind of exercise yes. where we just put up thoughts and things. I know you said you, you took the, that, those things, those papers away, those, those tear sheets. You were going to go talk to your caucus about them. What, what's happened from there? What, what, and, and I brought the wrong sheet because I, I actually have it on, on the takeaways from our um, group meeting. Um, we have instituted and I've, I've initiated a, a number of changes legislatively. We started up a um, business caucus, I started a business caucus within um, the Democratic uh, caucus itself, so uh, a business group. Um, so we could sensitize the rest of the caucus as to unintended consequences of some of the actions. Um, and I think that's what's lacking. Even when I have conversations with the speaker, there was one voting session and I said, you know, you're, you're, we have five tax increases in this voting session. He says, no, we don't. We, we're not doing anything on the corporate or the personal income or the sales tax. I said, no, no, no. We have to look through here. There, there, are, there are fees and in, 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 in taxes going in that you're not seeing. Um, so I think more and more we, and he's kind of stepped back, and I just don't think if you, if you don't have your antenna up, from a business perspective, from an economic or a financial perspective, some of the things that you're gonna be blind to. Um, it's, what we've done is, aside from putting through legislation, people say, why are you doing those things? I'm trying to raise the sensitivity um, around what we're doing and how else we can approach it. Senator, yeah. are similar well, conversations going yeah. on, on on your side of the house? Oh, all the time. Yeah, and, not, and quite frankly, um, when I sit on the budget with Senator Sullivan and stuff, we have these conversations all the time. And Senator Sweeney and I obviously have many conversations. Senator Kane, um, I'm on the Economic uh, Growth Committee as well as the Senate Budget and Appropriations. Um, the one thing I, I absolutely agree with, Rhonda, we, you know, we have, a, we have a great state. You know, we got the shore, we got the mountains, we, you know, we got Atlantic City, we, got every, we really do have everything. We also, so our assets were really good. We're, the one thing New Jersey is very good at is creating wealth, and the other thing that we're really good at is exporting it to everybody else, all right? So one of the things that we did <clears throat> through a major restructuring, and I, I look at this, you know, the CPA surveys that you had sent out all the time, which I think are, I think are excellent. I remember the one about the estate tax. What, what kind of um, you know, do, uh, you know, advice do you give your client? And I'm almost like 75% was um, leave. I think a third was leave, uh, telling them to leave. And another third basically um, was, you know, if they don't eliminate it, 
I'm going to tell them to leave. So we actually used that as part of the major restructuring to, to, to get it out. The other to eliminate the estate tax. And interestingly enough, we did it over an 18-month period. We got rid of it. So now it's gone. And I think the governor, and some of the governor's people have even said that they think it's actually working to keep some capital here. And I think that's one of the reasons why our direct payment was higher. But we're not going to know for sure until we see the IRS data, right? The other thing that we did is to raise the you know, pension exclusion in, uh, for retirement income. Now, I hate the cliff that's there, the 100000 not much over 100000 which is which has been, and, we, we, and quite frankly, we tried to address that. I still want to address that. But those are the changes that, that were made. So, so then, in the when we were making those changes, I think we started to get some of the reception that, hey, maybe New Jersey is starting to get its act together and tax restructuring, why not? And then the Murphy administration came in and started talking about millionaires tax and corporate tax increases and stuff. And I think we lost some of that momentum. And, one of the, and then when they did the federal tax changes, that's when Senator President Sweeney and I went to him and I said, listen, we need to have a committee that comes in and says, you know, what if they never bring back the state, you know, the, uh, the uh, SALT deduction? Uh, the only way for us to really deal with that is to lower the cost of government. And that's how we started that, that path, to, the path to progress. But I really do think when we made those changes to the estate tax and the retirement income, there had been some momentum, and you looked at the first couple of months of revenue that had come in after those changes, they were up higher than projected. And then all of a sudden, the, the talk about millionaires tax, corporate business tax, all these different fees, and I think it's, it slowed down. So. Yeah, I, I would agree with you in, in, in terms of the feedback that we've been getting from our members on that. Uh, let's uh, switch the conversation to the, the latest topic, which is the tax incentives. I think uh, in Politico this morning, there was a mention that two bills were out there to extend for a period of time. And uh, the political commentary also said that if the government would not support those. Well, this whole issue of, of tax incentives, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just, it's just interesting that what, what, what is and what isn't going on in there. So, um, Rhonda, let me go to you yeah, first good. and see what you're, <laughs> see what you're, you're hearing on, on that particular topic, and then I'll, I'll go to the legislation, and then, Jeff, I'll come back with you. Well, I just think, was it a year ago we were talking about Amazon tax incentives? You know, right, it's been an interesting year. Let's go back to that, where $7 billion isn't good enough. You um, should be in the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, it's been a very kind of fascinating year. So there was that Amazon mess. And now we have the situation. There's obviously a lot we don't know in terms of, you know, there have been reports, there's been some subpoenas, and uh, we know what was found with one investigation. So there's a lot we don't know. Let's fast forward to now. Um, whether it's the budget or the EDA, we're kind of running out of runway to get anything done by the deadline, so that there's that point. Um, but, you know, we had recently on NJTV the chairman of the EDA, Kevin Quinn, who's rather new, and uh, I asked him about the governor's plan because I hadn't seen a lot about, the governor wants to shift to smaller companies. So I said, I mean, even the Small Business Administration statistics show you smaller businesses are harder to survive. One year, three years, five years. So I asked him, well, you know, if, if we go that way, what sort of steps would be put in place to make sure that these businesses are survivable? Even any small business, it's tough. So I didn't get a good answer on that which I hope that's thought through. Um, it seems to me this is gonna have to be, uh, the business community doesn't want the incentives just to go away with nothing. So if there's gonna be no agreement by June 30th uh, and these incentives go away, I think it's legitimate if, you, if you're looking to move somewhere and start a business and you don't know what you're gonna get, why are you going to start a business in that state, right? We know other states use incentives. I mean, we're not the only people. It's the way business is done all over this country. Um, good luck. 
to the gentleman up here because uh, I hope there's a resolution quickly. I think the business groups are correct that if there is nothing in place, it doesn't help New Jersey. Uh, the question is, do the incentives we have now, how helpful were they, and will the new ones be any better? I, I, don't, I think the jury's completely out. Um, but I worry about the runway of getting something done. I don't know if there's a lineup of people that want to move here or are thinking about leaving and want to know what their incentives are. I mean, we don't really know um, if there's a backlog of companies that are rushing to New Jersey, but uh, you have to have some sort of tax incentive to compete against other states. And you better make sure they're effective. I mean, we this is you know we've had a lot to report on over the last year with incentives. So um, I, I just hope the next round that we're actually it's uh, out of the news cycle a little less because that means they're working better. Good luck. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I was around for the 2013 incentives, and uh, do we need an incentive plan? We absolutely do. Our, our, our total cost, our, our total tax structure is uncompetitive. Um, the incentives are the only thing that get us a seat at the table. So everybody knows our taxes are way too high. That's the reputation that New Jersey has. But in 2013, we were coming out of the Great Recession. We had just left the, le the only decade on recorded history in New Jersey where New Jersey had less private sector jobs at the end of the decade than when they started that, de that decade, the only time. So the situation now, obviously, and we had precipitous decline in revenue and whatnot. So when we put the economic incentive plan together, it focused on a few things. It focused on uh, you know, the, the amount of capital investment. The bigger, the better. Uh, you'd get more incentives that way. It also focused on specific industries. And did it, did it focus on specific cities? And what, yet, you know, more so than other places? Yes, it did. Um, and was, was in the bill was Camden, you know, used to try and get more economic incentive into Camden, because Camden had been ignored for years. So, so any sponsor of the bill, anybody voting on that bill knew that it, it was in there. Um, there was another significant thing that's in the bill that doesn't get talked about. It's called the net benefit test. And Senator Lesniak and I were, were in the committee when I said to Ray, I said, Ray, we, we need to have an economic, you know, net benefit test that you know, what they get back is some of the incremental that they give. He goes, great idea, and we put, he put it right in, right, in, right into it. So that is a, a significant thing that's there. Do we need to have that accountability? Absolutely. You know, we're talking in a room of auditors and whatnot. If, if, if somebody has fraudulently done something, then they should be accountable, you know, for that. But do we need an economic incentive plan with, with our tax structure being so uncompetitive? We absolutely need, uh, need to do that. We should have done a little bit more with the small business side, I think a little, little bit more. But at the time, we were focusing on who could really bring the big money in, the big jobs in, you know, right away. Because, but we're in a different situation right now, where the economy has gotten better. We're, we're, we've been slower coming out than the rest of the states, but we're certainly in a different situation than we were back then. You mentioned small business, and I'm going to come back to you on that because that's, I think, a, a big uh, concern with yeah. a lot of our members who service small business. But, uh, Assemblyman, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on this whole tax incentive thing? I, obviously, you know, we're not competitive within the region, so it would seem that we would want incentives for the governor to say, you know, I'm not going to support an extension of that. What, what does that mean to you? What, do you? what are your thoughts on that? Yesterday, I, in the Commerce Committee, where I sit, we voted on, I was a prime sponsor of this bill, of the seven-month extension of the existing program. And as I was voting on it, I was very clear about the fact that I was actually incredibly disappointed that we were voting on an extension of the program. I think that, the, I think that New Jersey needs a tax incentive program. I think it's just standard operating procedures with, with various different states. Um, but I also think the, the program needs to either be repaired or replaced. Um, I think there's elements. Where I sat through 10 hours of testimony now uh, on this. And my disappointment was, as a legislative body, we dropped the ball by allowing ourselves to be backed up to a deadline where we can't sit down and replace it or repair it. Um, because there's just not enough time on the calendar, and therefore we must extend it. 
I don't think, in fairness to the governor, we, we even vetted it, had a discussion about his proposal. Um, and, and I think we, that was a proposal out there. We often hear Senator Sweeney, when he talks about the pathway of the progress, said, these are my ideas. What are your ideas? I don't see anyone else's. Well, the governor did throw out some ideas, and I think we, out of fairness, we should have debated it. Um, I agree with, with Steve that we need to change it. We need to increase the governance around it. Um, that came out and was teased out very clearly. There needs to be more emphasis on small businesses. I don't think we've done really anything, and I think that really needs to change um, in, a whole, in a significant way. And we need to stop having one geographic area compete against another within New Jersey. So there's such a disparity in the calculation where you would, ha you would be forced to really go to the, the growth zones. Otherwise, you're doing financial malpractice by, not, by seeing the, the difference. And while we can encourage, and I think we should have some weighting, I think the current math of when you're in outside one of the growth mm -hmm. zones is just too wide of a gap. Um, we should be drawing in from outside New Jersey, not competing from within. Yeah. Jeff, what do you, uh, again, what are your colleagues and the other associations that we uh, collaborate with? What are their sentiments on this, on the tax incentive <clears throat> issue? Well, let, let me, first I have to make a plug for our podcast, or the communications people are going to kill me. Um, <laughs> we have uh, the society's Issues Watch podcast, which I, which I host, which covers uh, in depth, uh, you know, I interview a lot of people, so it really covers a lot of these different issues in depth. Uh, and you can find that at uh, njcpa.org slash podcast. Regarding the tax incentives, what I'm hearing in the business community in general is that. Um, they have worked, uh, and they have been mostly focused on larger corporations. They all point out the fact that while what you read in the, you know, the headlines are $11 billion given to corporations, and, and no, that's not true. Uh, potentially, it could be $11 billion, but they don't get any tax credits until they meet certain conditions of creating certain jobs, and I think only of the 11 billion or whatever it is over the last 10 years, only 1 billion maybe has been awarded. A little less. Less? Okay. A little less. So that's, uh, uh, you know, not clear to, to, the, to the public. Um, there's definitely a consensus that changes need to be made. The comptroller's report, uh, which did not knock the programs per se, but not the, the management and oversight. And that's, again, something that I think the press has uh, not really made clear. Um, I should add that the whole thing makes great soap opera. It gives me something <laughs> exciting to read every day where you have possible criminal you know, charges and you have the, uh, the uh, so-called South Jersey political boss fighting with the governor and you have three different commissions basically investigating each other. Um, but again, there is consensus that the current programs need to be revised. There's consensus that, uh, to a large extent, the programs that have been in place have worked. I think there's consensus that more of the programs need to be shifted to smaller businesses. Uh, which is something our members have shown in polls is true. I know the president of the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce has been saying that should be done for years. Personally, I think, I think it needs to um, be done. And I don't mean to knock the governor because I think personally, you know, I've met him. I, I think he's a great guy who means well. I think a lot of what he's doing has nothing to do with you know, just purely manipulative uh, or uh, I don't think it's so much, well, if I do this, I'll get this political support. I think he believes totally in what he's doing. I think he means well. Uh, but I think he'd make a better reverend than a lawmaker. Uh, <laughs> because I don't think a lot of what he's doing is practical and will really work. Because as long as people can leave New Jersey, 
to go to another state and it's that easy, you know, you have to be, you cannot be the, the highest tax state and you cannot be the most regulated state. It's just not, uh, you know, feasible. We're, we're not Sweden, you know. If you, if you live in Sweden, you can't really leave to go to another country without leaving your family behind and your culture. It's easy to leave to, uh, to New York. Anyway, I think it's unfortunate that the governor, in a sense, uh, started a huge fight with the Senate president over these incentives. By, by right with his, uh, his state of the state, he attacked the current mm. programs, and he said that you know all those who were awarded the incentives, or a lot of them, were just uh, high-powered, politically connected corporations, and I want to slash the programs, and they're no good, and I don't think that's the way to to, to you know, engage in a dialogue and, you know, make some positive changes. Small businesses, we talked about that. 360,000 small businesses in New Jersey have not gotten any attention that I can recall okay. recently. And the fact that they are here seems to say to me that we should be doing something for them. Now, I know we have a couple bills out there. Uh, one uh, is mirrors what's done on the federal level, okay. giving special credits for small businesses. And then we have another one for the pass-through entity. Correct. And it seems like those, in particular, the pass-through is a no-brainer. A no-brainer. And the 11th hour, the administration weighs in and it's changed from being helping small businesses to being a revenue raiser. What, what, why is it that we have these 360,000 small businesses here in New Jersey and we have not paid any attention? They're here, they, I mean, I often use the example if 10% of them hired another employee, what that would do to the unemployment statistics here. I was very disappointed when, because the, you know, the pastoral entity bill, you know, went through, you know, wide support for it, and then, uh, and quite frankly, there had been, to my knowledge, no discussion that the administration had said that there was any issues with it. And then also to come, uh, come up and make, you know, the suggested changes that essentially make it a revenue raiser as opposed to something that was gonna help with their, you know, the issue of the salt deduction, right? right? Um, and that was, that, to me, that was extremely, you know, because as you said, I thought that was a complete no-brainer huge bipartisan support. Um, some of the things that we do have to do much more for the small business, because like I said, on the, the other incentive plan, I mean, it, was, it was focused coming out of an economic, you know, a really severe recession, and we were still feeling it then. Um, but one thing I think that, that you know, it did help some of the small businesses, and I know there's an issue with the, you know, the estate tax, the inheritance tax, I know there's a question there. But when we eliminate the estate tax, one of the reasons why we did that, we said, listen, it's not all the necessarily the, the, the rich people and stuff is. When you can pass on a business, and the reason I'd love to eliminate the estate tax and the inheritance tax, and I actually have a bill to get the inheritance tax out, I just couldn't get them both out at one time, right? But the reason why we went after the estate tax is because you can transfer a business, you know, uh, and not have to pay the estate tax to a son or daughter, a, a, you know, a whether, a, you know, a spouse, uh, with the estate tax, you couldn't. I mean, the only one there is it would transfer to a spouse or a domestic partner. Boom, that was it. So uh, we're trying to bring down the cost because a lot of, a lot of uh, businesses would have to have the insurance costs with respect to hope to pay that estate tax. Um, but the whole, the whole idea of having, uh, focusing more on the small businesses is something we certainly have to do, particularly in this, you know, the, the governor's innovation economy, so just, right. I, I, I would agree with that. The, how you implement it maybe is something we gotta take a look at. I wanna make sure that no matter what kind of incentive program we have, my, my first thing is I'd love to have a tax structure that we didn't need an incentive program for, that it was just, it was a, a good value structure that we have, and we don't. There's no way anybody could say that we have that kind of structure. Um, but the idea to have something that helps the small businesses, whether it be capital gains, you know, reduction or tax, whether it be you can transfer a business 
um, you know, and not have, you know, to a family member and not have to pay any kind of, you know, you know, um, you know, income tax or capital gains, something like that. We really, we really do have to do because, as Rhonda said, you look at, I mean, the the small businesses, gen you know, help generate a significant part of our economy, but their success rate is is very low. You know? Um, but with the new with with new technology today, how many people would love to be able to sit and you know uh, you know be able to to, to have um, one of their own you know small businesses? Simon, you want to? I'm wait. going to start and ask you a question. <laughs> okay. What's your definition of a small business? Well, <coughs> if we look at the definition that came out for the minimum wage, which was very disappointing, of less than five or less than six employees. Uh, and, and, and that's another issue, too, in terms yeah. of that definition. Uh, that makes the society a big business in that regard, uh, which, you know, with 40 full-time equivalents, uh, you know, it, it was just puzzling to us. So Actually, on that voting session day, there were three different bills with three different three definitions, definitions. Of, of small business. Good and, point. And, and yeah. so I've been talking um, and trying to push forward um, and actually, I think I may even sent you part of the survey of what do we believe and how do we codify some of these definitions of a small business. So it, right now, I, I asked OLS, the Office of Legislative Services, for an accounting of how many different bills have different definitions <laughs> of small business. It was dozens and dozens yeah. of different definitions around this. So we don't even have a consensus of of what it is. We know that the, you know, the, at the federal level, I think, what is it, several hundred, and it, right. it depends upon um, what industry you're in, and it, it varies. Sometimes it, it's driven by revenue. Yeah, it's, right. Yeah. In point of the end, we, we need to think through that. I don't know if it makes sense anymore when we're trying to do carve outs that it's strictly employee headcount base. It made sense decades ago. More people you had, the bigger the business. But today you can have a very you can have a thriving business if it's internet based with a handful, but yet Main Street still still needs that support. Um, so I think that's where it starts with of again, how do you educate lawmakers around small business? How do we educate the rest of our colleagues around look what the unintended consequences are? The minute the you have the front office, you have the governor's office, that every time we put forth some of these incentives. They see it as a revenue decrease. They're not seeing it as potentially increasing revenue. So we do, so I take that as my fault and our fault because we're not selling it, we're not presenting the numbers properly as saying, yes, we are offering a tax incentive, but here is the upside associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, and if we did more of that, then I think we'd be more successful of getting some of these programs and initiatives through. There are a laundry list of different items that are sitting there that aren't moving, because we know they're dead on arrival from the governor's office, that everything from tax credits for your paid sick leave for the small businesses to being able to write off the um, immediate, rather than depreciating Section 129, allying that with the federal um, IRS numbers. There's a whole host of it, but each time it's perceived as, oh, you're just reducing revenue. So no, I'm trying to increase activity associated with this. Well, there's something in the wind that's uh, hopefully going to be put in play. Because I think part of the problem is there's not the front end discussions on this. And you talk about educating legislators. And I think that that's where there's a gap. And hopefully what uh, Opportunity New Jersey is thinking about doing something to that uh, to uh, help educate folks before they start weighing in and making decisions on various public policies that come to the forefront. Uh, so I, I, would, I would encourage you to push, push forward on the small business community because, you know, in today's environment, these businesses are very portable. They can pick up and move right away and, and go to other jurisdictions and, and carry out, you know, and run their businesses. One of the things that's popped up is, you know, the, 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 as a question is, our young people and the fact that it's no secret that New Jersey exports more high school seniors to go to college elsewhere and the fact that many of them don't come back. 
Um, so the question that's been, uh, you know, was asked of you, Rhonda, is what have you been hearing on that, that front? Um, it's interesting that our, our young people are, will go into New York, which is more expensive, as opposed to staying in New Jersey. And I have to believe it's because, you know, some of the things that New York has to offer that we don't have, like infrastructure, the ability to you live in a, in, in a place and not have to worry about having a car and all that kind of stuff, but what is it that we can do to keep them here? I mean, um, the competition for colleges and universities, particularly in the South, that draw our young people there to go to school and then they just keep them. What? You know, it's interesting. I mean, in the past year, we've done a lot of stories on all these developments popping up around transit hubs. That's a big thing. And it's designed to try to keep young people in an area. You know, it's always live, work, play. So you just go on the train, you go to your apartment, uh, there's something to do nearby. I think that's smart. I think that's a smart way to try to. Uh, bring a little bit of excitement, if you will, or make New Jersey more desirable. You don't need a car. You can save money that way. But look, for young people, I mean, if, if the adults who aren't even retired can't afford to stay in New Jersey, uh, it's, it's just tough. I mean, I'm not from New Jersey originally. When I moved here, so I came from kind of a depressed area at the time, and I moved to New Jersey, it was the land of opportunity. I could work in New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia, uh, I was able to manage a rent payment on a very low salary. Um, where I'm from, which is Pittsburgh, is where everyone's moving to. Why? Because rents are cheap. Now there's, um, there was Google and other companies that have kind of found it. The city had incentives, got these companies there. So um, I know we can do that in New Jersey since um, I you know, was excited to come to New Jersey originally. I think some of the efforts on the innovation economy are very interesting. I think that's exciting. It's an exciting industry for younger people. Uh, we're going to keep going around the cost side. If you want an apartment by yourself in certain communities, it's not going to happen. You're going to be rooming with three people, which is why it's cheaper in some cases to move to midtown Manhattan than living in Jersey City. Um, so. I think it's a combination of, of a lot of things, and that's where they live, prices, um, but developing opportunities. If, he, if the innovation economy really does take hold, I think that'd be great. I think um, you know, there's a great art scene in New Jersey, and, and not all young kids are leaving. I know the surveys have yeah. said that, uh, but I just think, you know, and, and some of them might see what their parents are going through. They're in a house where the parents are saying, oh, the minute you're done, we, we have to get out of here. Uh, and same with colleges. Our colleges, they could offer more competitive opportunities. I mean, I'm sure many of you here either have kids who went to college or have friends and their kids went. If a school offers a better deal out of state, yeah. you're likely going to take it. So. Uh, you know, that said, I know young people, I work with a lot of young people in my office that do love Jersey. They're living in Jersey City. Um, you know, some have left Hoboken. Uh, I, I wish a city like Trenton would really kind of rejuvenate mm -hmm. because I think these hubs are very interesting and I, I'm really going to watch what happens with some of these transit developments to see if it, it moves the needle at all. I, I think it's a smart idea and there's, there's a lot of that going around the state. So we'll see if it makes a difference. Hard to get around the cost right. part. One of the, the things that has popped up is uh, possibly some sort of uh, credit or whatever on a state tax, on, on state taxes for, because our students are incurring a lot of student debt these days. So uh, that's something that's popped up, I know, from our emerging leader group here at the society, is, is there something that can be done to uh, Give, give individuals a credit or to incentivize companies to um, help uh, with, that, with the student debt issue. And, and, and we've seen some companies do that kind of broadly on a national scale, not enough. But I think a young person would, you know, if you offer somebody a job and say you're going to handle X amount of student debt, it's very attractive. And for the companies in the state that say it's hard to find workers, because we are hearing that, and we know the unemployment is low, I think they have to think creatively right. about things like that. Right, exactly. 
Um, uh, another big issue that's always been an issue is about school districts here in New Jersey. We have regional high schools, but we don't have uh, for K through eight grade, eight grade regional regional school systems. And there's and in the Path to Progress uh, working group, there's a lot of discussion about regionalizing school di school districts to make them more efficient, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, also keep the, the quality of the education uh, uh, up as well. So, um, Senator, uh, I mean, Senator, I'm, I'm appointed you. <laughs> Assemblyman, what are your thoughts? What are you hearing in your caucus? Is, is there any discussion about that? Um, how are they reacting to it? Because it's a very sensitive issue here in New Jersey. And, and it is incredibly sensitive. I grew up on Long Island. We, so it's foreign to me to have all these tiny school districts. Uh, and when you look there, I think 275 school districts don't have a high school mm -hmm. um, in yeah. New Jersey. That's 275 um, administrations, that were, additional administrations that we're paying for, contributing to the pensions. It's a big number. Um, and, and I think it's the fear of the unknown, the fear of that schools will, I'll, I'm now going to have to send my child to a different school, which is not part of the proposal. No. The proposal is you can still, the schools and the bus, and you're still going to go the same place. We're just changing the structure um, for economic reasons. And to me, this should be the low-hanging fruit of how to begin the process. But now you're starting to chip away at a bigger issue, which is the home rule, um, the local, the different layers uh, of government, of services. Um, and now you're starting to touch upon even more sensitivity. So I think people are concerned about the slippery slope approach um, when you start this. But I, I don't know why we aren't doing that. Okay. The whole part of the, the issue, and I think some of the misconceptions was it was then for cost cutting and stuff. Right. And it wasn't. There was, no, there was actually no discussion about the cost cut. But if you have everybody going to the same high school at freshman year, in ninth grade, they all have to be on the same curriculum. They all have to be at the same level, hopefully, in advancement. And the reason for the, the recommendation was if they were going to be in the same you know, uh, ninth grade, let's have a structure, a regionalization of administration, of curriculum, of finance, of facilities, so that we can have a better, what can I say, and like more efficient way of operating. And when they all get to high school, they're all on, the, quote unquote, on the same on the same page. Former Commissioner Lucille Davies was, was a member of our committee, and they had made this recommendation way back when. And I think some of the a misconception and was, you know, we did make the recommendation of allow two counties to, if they wanted, on a voluntary but consolidate. But the term consolidation is, is that, you know, in, in losing schools or something, you know, could a, because of demographics, a school close? It's still a local decision in the recommendation that we had. But the idea of having a regionalization that, you know, your finance, your facilities, um, they could be, you know, certainly um, more efficient on a, on, a, on a regional basis, and we have regional we have regional school districts around the state right now, you know, in a number in a number of areas that are you know that are you know pretty pretty efficient. So that was the whole record, and it wasn't from the standpoint of okay, we're going to save this money. We did think that uh, in the future it would help burn, bend the cost curve, but it was really from a recommendation of how do we provide a better service. Another hot topic uh, as we start to wind down has been the whole issue of legalization of uh, ad adult use for marijuana. Um, it's been a lot of hype on it, but it just seems like it's not going to be going anywhere, uh, at least for sure in this budget, other than, you know, the, uh, I, I believe there's uh, public policy or legislation in about um, enhancing uh, medicinal Yep, uh, and expungement. One. Yeah, but there's, I guess the, the, the word on the street is that this potentially will go to a ballot initiative in the Constitutional. Is that because members of the legislature are uneasy about legalizing recreational mar marijuana? I, 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 I am. Uh, you, know, you think it should go to a ballot? 
No, I, I, am I uneasy about it? I mean, I, I, you look at the opioid crisis that we're having right now. I, I worry very much about the mixed messages that, that are out there. Um, I don't, you, you look at the numbers, people think that oh, it would be a real economic incentive, a real economic, the numbers are small. Um, so, I, you know, I certainly would, would um, I know Senator Rice was, and Senator Carnally, and Senator Rice was extremely, and Senator Rice was a former, you know, I think, you know, a police lieutenant in the, in the New in Newark, Newark um, you know, police department. He, and he was uh, extremely eloquent on why not to have, now, but there's, there's three different buckets. You had the medicinal, which had a lot of people agreed with. Then you had the quote unquote expungement, decriminalization, and then you had the legalization aspect. The medicinal, you know, it passed and, and it's going to it had wide, very wide support in both houses. The expungement issue had a lot of support. Here was the issue when the, when the expungement bill came in, they were actually expunging controlled dangerous substances and work, and which is heroin, fentanyl. And so in working with the sponsors, and Senator Cunningham was, it was, it was excellent to work with, she always is. They took out the controlled dangerous substances except for marijuana and hashish. Um, but the one thing that left in the expungement bill, because no, if, if they had left, they had taken this one part out, if it was for personal use, you would have had wide support for an expungement for small amounts. But the part that people didn't agree with, or the part, was five pounds, pounds of marijuana. Now, I had to go on the internet to find out how many joints can you get <laughs> for five pounds. It's up to 7,000. Now, obviously, it depends on how big you make them, but it's up to 7,000 joints. And the other issue is it combined with in a school zone. So that's a, that's a pusher, that's a dealer, and so on. Like so that, that I could not support. But had they gone to like the personal use side, like Senator Rice and Senator Singer <clears> had a bill that had more like eight ounces of stuff. And eight ounces is still you know, quite a bit for personal use stuff. We could have even agreed with something, you know, something like that. But five pounds, I should have brought in a wheelbarrow with five. This is what we were you know, talking about. Um, but then you got the issue of the, the, then the legalization, which I think most people are concerned about the, the mixed messages that, that would be out there. Okay. Real quickly, because I want to give everybody I, I don't, sort of a lightning round to go around and get final thoughts. Hey, I, I don't completely concur um, with the Senator's approach on this. Um, just on the five pound issue, it raised my eyes brow as well on the expungement of the five pound until I was informed that the way the code is currently written, it, the category of, of the arrest is one ounce to five pounds. Correct. So there's no distinguishing and there's no way of knowing was it one ounce, which yeah. some people say, all right, I don't have a problem with, or if it's five pounds, you kind of say, ooh, you know, I agree, that's a lot. But we could change that. Uh, we, we make laws all the but, time. Right, but but for right now, that's right. what the arrest record yeah. would sh say. So it'd be di it's difficult if you're going to expunge how you separate those that you wouldn't, there's no way of knowing. Right. The, in terms of the legalization, um, I've been, I personally don't have a problem with people. If they want to stay home, they want to smoke, that's their thing, that's fine. Uh, but I do think it should go to the referendum. Um, I think that it's something that um, it's such a divided issue, you're either one way, and, and I don't think this is a, an area where the legislature should be forcing it upon anyone. So the fact that it's playing out and it's ultimately going to go to the voters to decide should we legalize it, I think is the appropriate way of, of, of doing it. Okay. You're going to so, see a lot of spending next year <laughs> on this issue on both sides. Absolutely. You, you know, lots, the, millions and millions of dollars. Be. Let's get final thoughts from everyone about um, the future of New Jersey, uh, real quickly, what do you see are the big challenges? Obviously, we've talked about the pension, but um, so, Senator Orha, I'll start with you, and then we'll work uh, out. One of the things, are, I think one of the biggest challenges we have, what's the brand in New Jersey? I mean, we got such great, we really do have great assets. The first people think, that people think about is, oh, you know, on the cost side, you know, the high cost, but you look at the assets we have, and you know, listen, you've heard me talk all morning here, we gotta get the cost under control. But the issue of New Jersey, I mean, you know, people want to come to New Jersey. They want to stay in New Jersey. We've, we've got, you know, assets, you know, as I said, so many different things you can do. Plus the fact we're one of the best states at creating wealth. 
and then exporting it to this. So you can work well here in New Jersey. You can, you, you know, you, you know, you, right within a two-hour drive, you could be all over different, you know, different places. Um, and that's the thing I really worry about. What is the brand of New Jersey? It used to be New Jersey, you perfect together. So this, I, I don't know what our brand is any, anymore. And I really do think that that's one of the things that we have to, you know, and hopefully with the, with the message of you know, New Jersey getting their cost control, you know, under control, hopefully that would be part of that message and we can gain, we gain the trust of, of people who want to stay here, live here, committed to here, and that we can keep them here. Uh, Rhonda, your wish list or uh, how to move New Jersey forward? And so um, I wish we didn't rely so much on income tax in our budget, right. and I wish we were right now thinking about the next recession, not to be a Debbie Downer, but the economic cycle has been long nationally. <clears throat> so I hope the state does take steps, fiscal steps, to ensure its stability and growth and um, everyone plays nice in Trenton, like our gentleman here. Um, and the other thing I hope is I hope that New Jersey residents go to the polls and vote because as somebody who covers the state, uh, like we do at NJTV, it's very disheartening um, how few people care enough about what's going on in the state to actually go to the polls and cast a ballot. And it makes the job of the governor and legislature much harder. So uh, that is my hope. Jeff? Well, I'm just going to briefly touch on or look at uh, the intersection of um, policy, politics, and, uh, you know, the business uh, environment. Um, again, as I said before, if you want to watch a good TV show and see a lot of drama, the current political environment has, has lots of that. Uh, but as far as getting things done, uh, it's, it's not a positive thing. Uh, it's an unfortunate fight that we have between Senate President and, um, and the Governor. I do not see a rosy outlook for the, the policies that uh, the state is going to be passing or not acting on for the next, uh, you know, could be a long time, five, six years. Um, I, it's, it's not a good outlook. It's, it's never been a good outlook for long time, taxation-wise and so on. Uh, I only think, you know, to be perfectly honest, that it's, it's going to get, it's going to either stay the same or get worse. Uh, you know, but sometimes businesses, uh, can thrive anyway. Um, and certainly, even if they do manage to survive, it doesn't make things better or as good as they could be. But I'm honestly pessimistic as far as for what will be get done, what could be done, what will get done from a legislative perspective. And again, I hate to pick on the governor. Uh, again, I like him and I think he means well and he's a great person. But a lot of this uh, is driven is driven by him. He he seems to believe that by taking away from businesses and our wealthy people and distributing that money to lower income or, or lower middle class people, that then they'll spend more money and the economy will boom and everything will be great. And I just don't think that that really works. I'm incredibly depressed now. <laughs> you want some marijuana? Uh, <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, I hope you're dead wrong. Um, and, and I believe you are. Um, so I, I didn't join in and, and, and leave my job to do this because I was, thought we were doomed. I thought I, I'm an optimist um, and believe that we created all these problems, therefore we can fix them. Um, I think that we need to have a mindset change in, in Trenton that uh, it starts slowly, it starts with people like Steve and others that look at the role of government should be to be a partner in enabling growth, in enabling success rather than just a regulator. There is a regulation aspect, but we need to change the way in which people see 
business. You, can, you will never get an affordable New Jersey unless you have a thriving economy. Right. Um, so we're never going to get this. So I think that if we can get people to view it from a different lens, which can absolutely be done, then you're going to start seeing the change. Then the behavior change will come, um, where everything is not just, oh, they're making a lot of money, therefore let's, they have deep pockets. No, it's, it's, I, I think it starts there. So I am optimistic. I, yes, you have the personalities. Yes, you have the, the nonsense. I just hope it, it will get better if we look at things holistically rather than personal fights going on. Okay. If, if we can make more legislators like you, and you can Thank convince you. them, I Thank change you. my document. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me, let me throw my wish list out. My hope is that um, the legislature will avail themselves of the opportunity to, to hear um, the business community, to hear taxpayers and hear their concerns, so that they would, back to your point, become educated of the challenges and the things that they face. Uh, my other hope is that our members here will continue to fill out and, and participate in our surveys. Very which important. Are, which are, I think, very, been very, very uh, helpful to yep. um, the folks on the path to progress and also uh, the legislature as well. So do take that opportunity. They're very short and they're to give feedback because your feedback matters. Your voice needs to be heard out here in New Jersey because it does really work when, when, we, when we do weigh in. And I go back to the issue where the legislature was looking to um, surcharge licenses of CPAs to deal with the medical malpractice issue back. And on a weekend, 2,500 of our members either faxed, called, or sent letters to their respective legislators, and we got out of that. So do participate in those. It's very important. And I just want to thank our, our panel this morning. Help me thank them for all that they've done. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. And I guess we, uh, we're at that point of time where uh, the next session will be starting soon. So enjoy. Thank you all for your participation this morning with the questions that you've asked. We really appreciate you being here this morning with us. Thank you. <laughs>